Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Adherent Apologetics. As always, we're brought to you by you with your support, patreon.com slash Adherent Apologetics. Today, I'm here with Dr. Tyler McNabb. We're going to be talking about the evolutionary argument against naturalism. Uh, Tyler, welcome. How are you doing? Oh, very well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, looking forward to a fun conversation. Yeah, it should be fun. You're joining me all the way from uh, China, where it's about to be November 1st, so it's going to be Christmas season <laughs> then, right? <laughs> right, yeah, that, that's the post on Twitter, yeah. Uh, <laughs> got, got, got some hate from that, but uh, stick, <laughs> stick, by the, stick by my guns and say that uh, Christmas m music is permissible once Halloween is over, yeah. Well, you're a couple hours away from your Christmas music, and I will say that's, that's right. a hell worth dying on. I completely agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, I don't really understand... Like, okay, the people who want to argue that, like, wait for Thanksgiving, but I really don't understand the people who are, like, uh, like those super traditionalists who are, like, nope, Christmas Eve, right? And then and then you do it for, for 12 days, and then, then it's over, right? It's like, no. Yeah, those Christmas, like, fundamentalists need to go, honestly. <laughs> you need a more progressive understanding of That's Christmas right. and Christmas right. music. Christmas holiday season, like, it's, it's, it's a living season, and, you know, it's a changing season, so we need... We need... It's all about that joy. So, Tyler, um, just in case someone doesn't know, like, who you are, can you talk a little bit yeah. about, like, who you are and what you do, just in case uh, someone doesn't know who this Tyler right. McNabb guy is? <laughs> Whoever that guy is, yeah. Besides for being a devout defender of valid Christmas music season. <laughs> all right, all right, very good. Uh, yeah, so um, I, uh, I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at University of St. Joseph here at Macau, the only Catholic university in China. Um, and uh, before that, I spent a few years uh, being a professor at HBU, Houston Baptist University. And so um, I did my PhD at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. So I lived there for a few years. And uh, yeah, I specialize in epistemology and philosophy of religion. And if you combine these two fields, uh, religious epistemology. And so I uh, have a small volume with Cambridge University Press entitled Religious Epistemology. And uh, have a recent Five Views book with Bloomsbury Press um, on Christian religious epistemology, and uh, a book, co authored book with Eric Baldwin um, on kind of analyzing different world religions with Plantinga's epistemology, and, and then, you know, various papers in different journals and so forth. So I, that's kind of my, my, my niche is epistemology, but. Uh, I've written a little bit about uh, the evolutionary argument against naturalism and find it fascinating to think about. And so uh, was, yeah, definitely down to, to talk about it whenever uh, you uh, sent the invite. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. So what got you interested in like philosophy and like mm. the evolutionary argument against naturalism? Because obviously mm. you've done a lot of work getting a PhD in philosophy is not just something you like wake up and do. So <laughs> what, what makes you so interested in this topic? Right, right, right. Not, not, uh, um, what do you want to do today? I don't know. Maybe get a PhD <laughs> in philosophy. Uh, well, so um, I came to become serious about my faith. Uh, I had like a very short agnostic stint um, and was about to become an atheist. Long story short, had religious experience due to reading certain Old Testament passages, um, which I took and still take to be talking about Jesus, like Isaiah 53. And um, uh, ended up going to a very liberal Baptist university uh, thinking I was going to learn more about Jesus and how to understand my faith better and convey it, defend it, and all that sort of thing. And ended up, it was basically like, um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with like the Jesus seminar and that sort of thing, historical oh, Jesus uh, studies, like the far, <laughs> the far end of the spectrum. And and uh, Old Testament th theology was more like liberation theology 101. And and uh, yeah, so I was just like, oh man, this is uh, <laughs> what is, wasn't what I was expecting. So uh, I um, continued to get more into apologetics, more into philosophy, and uh, ended up um, transferring universities. And I transferred to an evangelical college. And weirdly enough, I had like this, I, I didn't really have doubts, struggling with doubts at um, this, the liberal university, but I had doubts uh, at, huh. at, when I was at this evangelical university. And like these doubts came back and from like the first time really since I got serious about my faith. And uh, uh, I was under like a really bad epistemology. I was I was convinced that like in order to know anything, you had to be absolutely certain, like infallible, right? The belief had to be mm. such that you could be wrong about it. And 
I was super scared uh, that some smart philosophy professor was just going to come up to me one day and show me that I didn't know what I was talking about and that would strip away my knowledge or, you know, my justification, you know, whatever. And uh, this just really worried me. And I, I was plagued for a long time <laughs> with it. One argument that gave me comfort at times was an argument that I now reject. <laughs> but it gave me comfort then. Um, and basically, it was this idea that uh, if naturalism is true, then um, determinism is true. And if determinism is true, then uh, our beliefs are determined and aren't, aren't rational or aren't, don't constitute knowledge or whatever. Um, and so uh, this was argument I first heard from Greg Bonson. So for those who are familiar with uh, the presuppositional sort of tradition, um, that's what uh, really influenced me at the time. And uh, then um, whenever I started to learn really good epistemology, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, when I, I started reading Warranted Christian Belief, Alvin Plantica's work, and was like, oh, this is right. This is, this is where it's at. And I can know that God exists or that Christianity is true apart from argumentation. Like, it could just really seem to me to be the case. And if that experience, that seeming is the product of my faculties, my brain working rightly, <laughs> then, you know, then I can know. And, and uh, then I realized, well, wait a minute. Even if determinism is true, if Plantica is right, like, uh, I could still know stuff and still be rational about stuff because he, he views rationality primarily in different ways. But the one he's most concerned about is rationality is proper function. So you can have this sort of rationality on determinism, I take it. But nonetheless, Plantinga offered an argument that was kind of in the same ballpark, right, as, as this argument um, that I mentioned. Um, he, he offered the evolutionary argument against naturalism, where it's basically like you're still just going to take what the atheist is sort of committed to and endorses, and you're going to try to turn that <laughs> around and put it on upside, uh, upside down and, and, you know, show that, that the uh, atheist worldview is still irrational upon at least reflection. Uh, the reflective naturalist who really digs in deep and looks into this uh, will see that, you know, he or she is being irrational and accepting both atheism or naturalism. I'll use these two terms interchangeably uh, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, neo-Darwinian evolution. So uh, that's kind of what, what, what made it sort of attractive to, uh, to me is because back in my earlier days, I sort of bought into this argument. I don't know, call it for argument from determinism, <laughs> uh, a variation of the argument from reason. And then um when I started looking more into epistemology, I realized that maybe that argument wasn't as good as I once thought it was, but there's an argument that I think maybe has a better chance of working and basically gets to a similar sort of place. So that's kind of my interest, where my interest lies with respect to the argument. Yeah, uh, not to get too far off topic, but you talked a lot about like religious epistemology. So there's something interesting. Um, I don't think it comes up as much in terms of like philosophical circles, but more in like the online, like uh, atheism, non-believing circle is this idea of like a, a very high emphasis on empiricism, on you mm. need some sort of like demonstration for the belief in God. Right, like right. That would right. warrant, warrant belief for them in their mind. So uh, very briefly, like if you get into like that kind of like idea of like a demonstration or empirical right. verifiability, like how do you tackle that topic? Like from your standpoint on like what makes a belief in God rational? Right. Yeah. Very good question. Uh, so, um, one of the, in fact, I just wrote a, a little blog post for, um, Word on Fire Ministries. It's a Catholic evangelist ministry, um, Bishop Barron, for those who, who are familiar with him. Um, he, uh, are in, in, in the little blog post, I talked about like, um, learning, learning from your dog <laughs> about skepticism. And, and so, uh, a lot of philosophers, a lot of epistemologists think that, um, there's a type of knowledge that infants and dogs and cats and other various animals <laughs> and human infants can all have, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Ernest Sosa, the esteemed epistemologist um, from Rutgers, calls it uh, animal knowledge, right? Um, I'm not sure if he was the first to really call it animal knowledge, but I know he makes a really big deal out of it, and lots of people have followed him. So I'm not sure exactly where the phrase originates, but for sure, at least Ernest Sosa uses it and people follow him. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so animal knowledge is this like knowledge. It's like you're not really like reflecting on uh, uh, various uh, states of affairs and you know kind of thinking through things 
uh, like you you would at this sort of higher order reflective level that you know sometimes humans uh, human persons think through, right? Um, it's that rather it's this sort of knowledge that um, that uh, really I take to be the product of um, sort of an experience working in conjunction with um, um, one's faculties, one, one's uh, mind and uh, sort of like a natural response to a particular experience. And so it's a, an immediate belief, um, a belief not held um, by way of arguments. And so animals seem like they, they know stuff, right? Like uh, if someone broke into my apartment right now, um, my dog would very likely be like, you're not supposed to be here, you know, grr. <laughs> um, <laughs> if uh, I came home, my dog gets excited, right? I think I say in the blog, like, if I come home with burger and fries, my dog will even be more excited <laughs> and will come sniffing the, the bag and, you know, like, wanting me to give her food, right? Like, my dog knows when I have food and I'm eating my food. She looks at me like, you know, just today she's going to put her paw up on the table, like, aren't you going to give me some, right? Um, so, I mean, animals have knowledge, right? But they don't have these arguments, right? It's not like they have access to, um, to inf- you know, uh, to argue from the best explanation of the data in which they're experiencing or they're, they don't have deductive syllogisms or uh, I think it's very implausible to think that they're like subconsciously doing calculus, you know. Um, and so, no, I mean, it, does, it, it seems like we can have knowledge um, and yet lack arguments. Um, and so it seems like having access isn't necessary, maybe for certain beliefs in order to be rational as God's designed us, our, our faculties or, you know, one wants to say natural selection, whatever, um, uh, maybe certain beliefs in order to possess appropriately, we need to have arguments. But it seems very plausible, I think, when we think about animals and infants, that all sorts of other beliefs don't. They could just be sort of what philosophers call properly basic, held rationally apart from argument. And so just like, uh, you know, if I walked into my class <laughs> and I opened up the door and I looked at various, um, you know, uh, uh, my sensory experience was sort of leading me to believe that there were different people in the room, right? And this sort of ex- this the seeming that I would have, where it seems like there's people in this room, would move upon my faculties, and uh, you know, my faculties would process this and produce the belief that other people are in this room. It's not based off arguments, right? I'm, I'm not uh, doing what Descartes does <laughs> in his meditations or anything like that, right? I'm, uh, I, it's just sort of a natural belief. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think belief in God is like that as well, um, at least for a lot of us. And uh, cognitive science of religion seems to support the idea that religious belief is natural to, to humans uh, for various reasons I can get into if, if, if you want. But, um, yeah, so it, it, I, I think that for the skeptic who's like, no, give me arguments or it's stupid or rational or you don't know it. Um, I guess one counterexample that philosophers tend to give is. Um, animals are infants because it seems like surely like they know stuff and yet they don't have access to arguments. So I guess that would be my first um, response to them. Yeah, definitely. Um, but we'll go to the evolutionary argument against naturalism. There's so much there. And I know you've done a lot of written work and interviews talking about belief in God and just being like properly basic and stuff. But uh, with the evolutionary argument against naturalism, like basically like if it sounds like a lot of big words, maybe if someone doesn't isn't familiar with it. But if, like, if you were to summarize the argument, like what would you say is the evolutionary argument against naturalism? Right, right. So again, naturalism for our sake, let's just say like no God, no ghosts. <laughs> Um, no souls uh, that are like immaterial substances, you know, existing apart from the body. I think this is how Berg, Michael Bergman uh, defines it uh, for the sake of uh, the argument. Um, so uh, naturalism uh, and the idea of, you know, evolution. So contemporary evolutionary theory, right? Uh, mainstream view is just fine to, to go with this. The idea is that if you, if you affirm both of these, Right. If you affirm both of these propositions, um, you're going to end up, if, if you're reflecting on it, you're going to end up having a defeater. <laughs> and upon realizing, so a defeater is like a um, uh, kind of like a reason or a belief that makes your original belief uh, implausible, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it sort of defeats it. So um, 
it will make it such that um, originally, maybe even if you were rational in your belief or something like that, um, now you get a defeater, it's no longer rational. So let's take, for example, um, uh, here. <laughs> yellow wall right here. <laughs> Um, now, let's say I formed the belief that it's yellow, right? I have a certain experience. It seems yellow to me. Um, so I formed the belief with my back please function that it's yellow. Now, what if someone comes in and says, actually, the lighting in here makes all walls look yellow. Um, and so that could, be, that could be blue. But uh, actually, the, the light in here, right? <laughs> the light in here, I can't, I can't see it, uh, will make it seem yellow. And maybe they even show me a video about like these particular lights, you know, uh, making rooms look like yellow, even though they were very different colors. And they're like, yeah, we installed these lights. You know, here's, here's some evidence, right? Here's some photographs. And then I thought, oh, okay. Well, maybe now I have a defeater, right? Maybe now I have a defeater for thinking this is yellow. Um, or, you know, the, the, the world doesn't seem to be spinning <laughs> at a ridiculous rate, right, um, on its axis. Uh, but yet, maybe someone comes along and shows me scientific information or, or data, and I realize I have a defeater for my belief. Um, and so the idea is that if you affirm both evolution and naturalism, that uh, you will sort of develop a defeater for trusting your cognitive faculties. Hmm. Um, so, you know, those faculties responsible for um, what you perceive, your memory, right? Maybe your belief in other minds, your inductive, deductive, abductive abilities, right? These cognitive abilities, these cognitive faculties will have a defeater for thinking that they're actually reliable, that they actually get to truth. So um, one way to understand reliability is like, think about like a car, right? You get in a car. Uh, and it's reliable insofar as it gets you to places, right, without breaking down, or at least if it does break down, it's on rare occasions, right? Hmm. Um, and so that's that's kind of the idea, is that our faculties, they're not infallible, but, you know, they get us to truth, you know, a lot. They're, they're reliable, right, like a car. And so um, if you have a defeater that your cognitive faculties are reliable, well, then guess what? You're going to have a defeater also for the beliefs that they produce, and those beliefs would include the belief in naturalism, right? And so uh, then it becomes sort of self-defeating, right? If you affirm mm. naturalism and evolution, then uh, you're, in a, you're, you're going to, to end up having a defeater for your faculties. And if you have a defeater for your faculties, you're going to end up having a defeater for your belief in naturalism. Mm. And so the, you're, you're in this really predicament that's not fun to be in if you're a naturalist. <laughs> and uh, uh, you'll... you'll you know, be irrational if you continue to affirm naturalism. And so the idea is, uh, well, hey, why? And in order to save evolution, so to speak, <laughs> let's break apart evolution uh, from naturalism, and instead let's let's put it, uh, let's conjoin it to theism. Mm. And uh, in this case, right, even if God used evolution as a means to bring us about in the way that He did, uh, well, at least He's guided the the process. Um, usually when, um, for example, uh, uh, Plantinga does a good job of this and where the conflict really lies, where he talks about, uh, when biologists talk about random mutation, what they mean is that there's no physical mechanism inside or outside the organism that's, um, dictating the next mutation. And so obviously it could still be random in that sense because God's not a material mechanism, right? Uh, inside or outside the organism. So uh, you can still affirm random mutation, and God's guiding the process, and uh, you know um, you, you 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 can trust your, your your faculties, and you can have warranted belief, but not so much with atheism. So the idea is that uh, if you, if you want to affirm evolution, you need to be a theist. Um, that's 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 what all the cool kids should do. Uh, and and so the the main um, kind of thrust that's motivating this idea that you can't trust your faculties. Uh, would you like me to speak to that? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Go for it. Uh, okay, so the idea is that, like, um, in organisms, <laughs> uh, whenever they have mutations, generally, like, they're not advantageous for the organism, right? Mm. Uh, I mean, you see this a lot with, like, viruses will get mutations, and, you know, it, it makes the virus not as um, successful, <laughs> uh, right? Oftentimes, it weakens the virus. Um, but sometimes mutations can be advantageous, 
And sometimes the mutations can uh, aid the organism in continual survival. And, uh, you know, if we're thinking about uh, more complex organisms, right, the, the idea that they can, uh, when they procreate, their perogeny will have these adv advantageous mutations and they'll survive better off than these other organisms that are similar to them, but lack this organism, or mutation, sorry. And so um, eventually the idea is that, uh, um, that uh, we kind of can grasp what our cognitive faculties, sort of how they've come about and sort of what they're aimed toward, right? Obviously not directly, because it's not like evolution's a person who's like aiming our faculties in a certain way, right? But in a sort of indirect way, it's, uh, it's the idea is that our faculties um, uh, get us in the right place at the right time. So Patricia Churchland, a famous philosopher of mind, she's an eliminativist. Uh, she, you know, no, no, no friend to theism. <laughs> um, she says that uh, our faculties, you know, therefore, uh, uh, are, they're, they're sort of aimed, geared toward uh, allowing us to feed and fight and flee and reproduce. And so if you think about that, like why, why trust our cognitive faculties? Like why trust that they're producing true beliefs? Um, it, it seems like the probability that they're reliable, if that's how they've sort of come about and that's what, you know, that's how they've been kept and that's, that's sort of indirectly, you know, what they're aimed toward, uh, or de facto aimed toward at least. Um, well, why, why, why trust them? It seems like at best, the probability of them being reliable is just kind of unknowable, right? We can't know it. Or, you know, at worst, the probability of them being reliable is actually low. So the idea is maybe that um, first, why should we think that the content of our beliefs are reflecting truth, you know, reflecting reality, right? Maybe as long as these like neurophysiological properties are working in just the right place or, you know, working in the right way, maybe it doesn't even have to match up to our content or something like that. But let's, let's go ahead and say for argument's sake uh, that the belief content um, uh, does um, play a, a significant role in um, our actions, right? Uh, why think that given uh, our um, belief content being sort of aimed towards survival and reproduction, why think that, uh, that our belief content has to be true? And so, I mean, as long as you can come up with various different scenarios where um, a certain belief would get your body part in the right place at the right time, right? It doesn't have to be true. So Plantinga gives this kind of funny example in his 1993 work, um, Warrant uh, and Proper Function, uh, about a guy named, I think his name's Paul. And, uh, you know, he's this guy just trying to survive, right? Maybe um, if he had the belief that uh, the best way to um, pet a tiger is to run away from it, right? And he really wants to pet the tiger, right? Well, this belief obviously is a false belief, right? The best way to pet a tiger is not to pet, or, uh, is not to run away from it, right? The best way to pet a tiger is to come up to it and pet it. But obviously that belief would not be <laughs> uh, advantageous, right? Or it, to, the idea of like, it's a good idea to go pet a tiger, right? That's, 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 that's not something you'd want to do. And so uh, nonetheless though, if you, have this, if you have this false belief, namely the belief that the best way to pet a tiger is to run away from it, well, it's going to lead you in survival still. Right. Namely, you're going to be running away from the tiger, which is what you should be doing. <laughs> so uh, he, you know, he gives various different ways in which uh, to explain how um, beliefs could uh, aid us in survival and reproduction, but yet still be false. So as long mm -hmm. as we can make that content uh, uh, move our body to the right place at the right time, the truth of the content is kind of irrelevant. Right. As, as, as long as the, the content does its job and uh, making our body parts go in the right place at the right time, that's that's fine. Right. So that, that that's kind of the sketch of the argument. You know, this is kind of what's motivating. Uh, well, hey, uh, there's all sorts of ways maybe that we could believe that would still get our body parts in the right place at the right time. Why think that uh, our beliefs that we have currently uh, are true? Right. They actually do match up with reality if there are all these other alternatives. 
So the probability that our beliefs are uh, true is uh, low or unknowable. And, uh, and so, yeah, we have a defeater for trusting our, if they're lower and inscrutable, uh, we have a defeater for trusting our faculties. And if we have a defeater for trusting our faculties, we have a defeater for trusting or for, for believing in naturalism. And so it goes something, something like this is a rough version of the argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just saying that obviously we can't trust our faculties if necessarily if, um, just with what you've been talking about, if they're a product of just like blind evolution. I right. think you laid that out really well. So obviously I was looking a little bit um, a couple of days ago and yesterday into like objections. And there's a lot of work from a lot of people on <laughs> like objections to this argument. So there's a lot there. So I figured instead of just like trying to throw things together, I just figured I'd give it to you. Like, what do you think are some of like the best objections to this argument? Like, how do you like kind of respond to them? Right. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's two objections that I find the most interesting uh, that have sort of given me the most thought in reference to reflecting on the argument. Um, one objection is called like this kind of like common sense objection, right? Where uh, the idea is just it's obvious that uh, if you were um, uh, that uh, if you were to survive then you're going to have to produce true belief. Um, and so the idea is like, if, if you need water, you're going to have to produce the belief that water is over there instead of being over there, right? Or that the grizzly bear is dangerous and fierce and in front of me <laughs> and I need a jet, right? And uh, so the idea is just that, well, you, you know, the, the part I mentioned earlier isn't going to be so controversial. The the what's going to be controversial is this idea that um, uh, maybe we have to have certain core beliefs be true in order to survive. Right? You're going to have to think that the bear is fierce, um, even if you don't think it's a bear, even if you believe it's like a, um, I don't know, um, a witch or something. Uh, you're going to have to believe that it's fierce. That's a belief. You're going to have to believe that it's dangerous. That's another belief. You're going to have to believe that you need to run that way or that way. It's another belief, right? So you're going to have a lot of true beliefs still that are sort of going to, you're, you're going to have to uh, affirm certain propositions in order to, to really survive and reproduce. And so natural selection is going to make sure that we believe at least a lot of true things, even if we have some false beliefs um, that we're unaware about. Nonetheless, we're going to have to have a lot of true beliefs. So that, that's, that's one objection. Um, Alvin Plantiga, in response to this, uh, for example, in his uh, the volume edited by James Bielby, um, Naturalism Defeated? Question mark. Um, in that volume, Plantinga says, "Well, you know, why why think this is the case, right? Why why can't um, they simply form um, beliefs such that uh, let's let's say the bear's a witch, right? Um, that that's a fierce witch, right? But they actually don't reflect." on the possibility that, well, if that's a fierce witch, then it also must be a fierce object, or you know, that must be a, um, a dangerous object or a strong object, right? They just kind of, they just have these sort of simple beliefs that they don't reflect on these entailments, right? I mean, we have that all the time, actually, like where we, we'll believe something, we'll believe P, and P will entail Q, but we actually don't, uh, reflect on or believe Q. Like we don't think that actually Q is entailed by P, right? So we believe P without believing Q, even though if you really reflect on it, P does entail Q, right? So maybe we're just form beliefs like this and we don't reflect on their entailments, right? Plenty of gives some sort of sketch like this uh, in the Naturalism Defeated volume. Um, my favorite approach though, uh, I really think the best version, the strongest version of this argument uh, has been uh, largely developed by a philosopher named Tom Crisp. And uh, Tom Crisp, basically, he, instead of focusing on all beliefs, right, he, he, narrows, um, he narrows it down to, to specifically beliefs that are produced from our, um, I don't know, for um, our sake, let's just call them uh, complex abductive faculties, right? So abduction is this way of reasoning where we try to do inference the best explanation, right? We see which, hypothe uh, which hypothesis uh, out of these hypotheses, you know, better explains the data, right? So which hypothesis should we pick? This one, right? Over these other hypotheses, right? Um, 
Yeah, so uh, call this abductive reasoning. Well, abduction, it uh, requires uh, a lot of sophisticated sort of imagination, mm -hmm. right? At least when it comes to these kind of more, more higher order metaphysical or scientific beliefs. Um, maybe you don't think it requires that at a very like local level. So, you know, here's a bottle of water. Let's say um, my son is here, right? Say, as far as I know, we're the only two people in the apartment. <laughs> um, let's say all of a sudden my water bottle becomes empty without me drinking it, right? I mean, I could technically postulate someone came in, broke in, drank my water bottle and left, right? Or I could technically imagine another scenario where like the water bottle fairy comes and, you know, zaps up all the water and, and leaves. Uh, or maybe uh, my dog somehow, I could postulate my imagination could lead me to believe that the dog uses its paw, right, to open it up and, and drink all my water and then close it back up and put it down. So, I mean, like, you know, or, or think about like a more caveman style, right? Like you see the bushes moving and you hear this big growl. <laughs> you could postulate that it was several different things, but really like the imagination required for this sort of reasoning isn't maybe, um, uh, it doesn't need to be so robust, right? But now think about the imagination needed to think about all the alternative hypotheses um, with respect to uh, explaining data about quantum mechanics and virtual particles or um, theories of time, right? A versus B, eternalism, presentism, internal blockism, uh, sorry, um, uh, growing blockism, you know, uh, or uh, different theories about abstract objects or, uh, you know, different uh, takes uh, about, um, you know, Einstein's relativity versus like a Lorenz uh, interpretation or when you get to, uh, in theory, like when you, when you get to all these various complex theories in metaphysics or science, it's like, man, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's the imagination that's required uh, to think that we can sort of track and come up with rural alternatives. And so we can figure out which hypothesis um, um, actually is plausible compared to other um, competing theories. Uh, it's quite intense, it's quite, it's quite a lot. And so if we're gonna really have a justified inference that this hypothesis is better than this hypothesis or this hypothesis, we need to actually, we think that we're reliably coming up with sort of um, uh, reasonable hypotheses, right? Uh, and so, but why think we can do that? Like, why think our abstraction skill and imagination ability, right, um, is actually getting us to, uh, to, to come up with relative, plausible, competing views? Um, why think that our complex uh, abductive, our faculties responsible for producing complex uh, beliefs like this in an abductive fashion, why I think that they're really reliable. Like it's one thing to think that uh, our faculties need to be uh, reliable at this very local level where it's like, ooh, danger, right there, run, right? Maybe there's some sort of evolutionary story that you can tell to help make this plausible that we have reliable faculties. But when it comes to this more abstract stuff, um, why, why, why think that uh, our faculties uh, would be reliable with respect to these things. And then it's like, if you're an atheist, you have a defeater for doing high level science and, and uh, metaphysics. And then of course, it can still be self-defeating as I uh, point out in um, my World Religions book with Eric Baldwin, that uh, if your belief in atheism comes about from these complex abductive faculties, right? You're using the problem of evil, right? Like the, think about the sophisticated atheist, right? He's using the problem of evil, the problem of divine hiddenness. He's getting into Bayes theory, uh, Bayes theorem, and he's trying to figure out which hypothesis is better. And, and he's getting to really some complex things, right? And he's discovering, fine tuning. He's, you know, so, so think about the, this sort of atheist, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if this sort of atheist is coming to his belief in atheism through these complex abductive faculties, then guess what? Uh, if you have a defeater for these faculties responsible for producing 
um, these these sorts of beliefs, then and uh, atheism is fits into this category, then you'll have a defeater for uh, believing in in uh, atheism as well, and so it'll again be self defeating. So uh, Tom Chris doesn't make this exact move, but I, I I sort of extend his view and and try to make self defeating argument still. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of the best way to really flesh out that response to that sort of argument. Um, the, only, the other argument, uh, the other objection I actually think is better than this objection, um, says something like, um, says something like, um, uh, it's just obvious to us that our faculties are reliable. So basically they grant you, yeah, the probability of having reliable faculties on uh, naturalism and evolution is really low. That's right. But, you know, it just seems obvious to me that I have true beliefs. It just seems obvious to me that my faculties are reliable. And so uh, a, a epistemologist will you know, use, use a, a phrase, right? So Bergman in, in this Naturalism Defeated volume that I mentioned earlier, um, he, he talks about having a you know, strong experience that inclines you to a particular belief, right? And, and he calls this a seeming. And so you have like the strong seeming that your faculties are reliable. And the sort of your, your confidence level in that your faculties are reliable so high, even upon reflection of this sort of defeater, uh, you're, you're, you're still justified in, in believing that your faculties are reliable. This, the power of uh, your confidence that your faculties are reliable from this strong seeming is going to sort of overwhelm the potential defeater that's given through this argument. Mm. That's sort of the um, easiest way I can construe it without getting into a lot more <laughs> explanation. But um, yeah, so uh, Bergman's just kind of, and Berg, Bergman's a Christian, right? He's actually the president of the Society of Christian Philosophers right now, right? I mean, he's a serious Christian. Um, and so he thinks that this sort of Thomas Reed inspired response is, is kind of a good response. And so, and uh, Eric Baldwin and I's work, what, what we end up arguing is that, um, uh, when it comes to making this sort of move, we think that at least when it comes to warrant, when it comes to knowledge, you're going to actually have to um, have these proper function conditions playing a role with the seeming uh, to really get you knowledge. And uh, as we argue in the book, as Planega argues, uh, and his uh, warrant proper function is to be with uh, Thule, knowledge of God. Um, there's really no good naturalistic account of proper function. So if you think proper function is necessary for warrant, then uh, and you think naturalism uh, can't supply sort of the preconditions to make uh, proper function intelligible, well, then you're in trouble if you're a naturalist and a proper functionalist. And so um, we we ultimately argue that this sort of approach really won't work, right? Thomas Reed depended on proper function. He was a proper functionalist, and we think proper function can only be made sense with God. So we don't think this sort of, um, well, it's just common sense that our faculties are reliable uh, sort of approach is really going to work unless you're going to invoke theism, in which if you're going to invoke theism, then, you know, the argument's kind of superfluous. So uh, that that's that's those are the two best objections. I'm aware of, and th those would be my two responses to them. Yeah, thank you. Great, great job, like just walking through them. Really appreciate it. So, uh, one thing we'll go to just before we wrap things up is talking a little bit, like about like objections, maybe like pop culture, or, like misunderstandings, like from people who maybe aren't in like philosophical circles and looking at these arguments on like, a professional level. Like, what do you think gets misunderstood about the argument? Like, right. in terms of like just people who are on the street or have a YouTube channel or something like that, and just. Yeah. They, they just give it, you're just like, oh, no, don't say that. Um, right. like, what, what do you think is misunderstood about the argument? Uh, like, I've, I've seen, like, on YouTube before where someone's like, oh, a sophomore in biology, you know, could could uh, show you what's wrong with this objection, right, <laughs> Super confidently and so forth. Um, yeah, well, uh, I think if you're, um, I think actually plenty of original way of construing where it's all of our faculties, uh, I think that it works, but I think the best, strongest version is in reference to specifically these more um, highly technical, scientific, metaphysical beliefs, right? These beliefs are coming about through uh, complex, abductive reasoning. I think that if you want to uh, really deal with this argument, that's the strongest form that you should deal with. In a lot of presentations from atheists, 
you know, so I've had some atheist friends who would tell me, oh, you got to read this paper. You got to read this paper. So then I, I read it. And it's an academic paper. Um, and it's good. You know, it's a good paper, well written. But uh, it actually doesn't address the stronger version, right? It'll like only, it only addresses like this kind of more weaker version of the argument, I think. So, uh, and that's, that seems to be true in my experience with like YouTube atheism as well, that it, it's uh, oftentimes it's not this stronger version of the argument. It's this um, kind of the, the more traditional version that was, this, that was first given in 1993 that's being dealt with. And so mm -hmm. I would encourage them to check out Tom Crisp's um, article in the Blackwell Companion to Naturalism. Um, so that's, I think, where he has his most recent development and work uh, uh, that I largely um, in it, am indebted to in my own defense of the argument. So that, that, that that's, uh, would be my first um, um, kind of encouragement. The second uh, would be probably just something like, um, and this is kind of a general rule just for all philosophers, I mean, for, for um, any view, not just the evolutionary argument against naturalism. Um, but if someone has a PhD and someone has peer-reviewed publications, especially multiple peer-reviewed publications on a particular topic, and you quickly look at it and say, oh, this is obviously false, and you have some explanation for why it's obviously false. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical. <laughs> um, you know, maybe maybe you haven't understood the argument or the best sort of responses, you know, uh, maybe you haven't looked into all the objections. So I would encourage you to, you know, um, on both sides, right? If you think the argument's good, read uh, objections posed by Thule or posed by those contributors uh, in the Naturalism Defeated volume, right? Or some more recent papers. Uh, read Willenberg, you know, read read, read some, some updated uh, criticisms of it. But also, if you're not a fan of the argument, right? read uh, some up-to-date responses to it or, or up-to-date re-articulations of the argument, right? Different glossings of the argument. And, and then once you've, you know, read a bit of literature here and there, um, then maybe, you know, be more confident in your, in your claim. Not like I think that um, uh, you have to be able to refute an argument to know that something is off or, or to know something is, is true or false, but uh, I guess just the idea where if, if, if you think you have a reasoned explanation, like a, an argument in itself, why this is false, and, you know, you don't have graduate degrees and peer review publications, probably uh, might be a good idea to just be like, well, before I claim this is obviously false for X, Y, Z, let me read the literature first. Um, because I, I have a feeling people who claim that a sophomore biology student uh, could refute Planiga on this, uh, I think probably they're, 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 they're wrong, so. <laughs> um, kind of like last thing here before we wrap this up is, uh, obviously a lot of people do think that this argument may be like dead or debunked, you know, all those things, nasty things you can say about how these are all blind and stuff. Um, but like for someone who like, is very skeptical of the argument, where would you point them to, to like, hey, check this out or look, right. look at this to really kind of like understand the totality of like what's going on here? Right, yeah, so I definitely would have them, it's not dead by any means. Um, like I said, Tom Chris had a recent, somewhat recent publication in the Blackwell Companion to Naturalism defending this this sort of uh, argument, the, the one, the second sort of way that I expressed. Um, you know, I have uh, a couple of publications defending this, one in uh, our volume, another article where, um, I talk about it in Philosophia, a Christie issue where I had a panel discussion with Willenberg and Craig and Murphy. Um, and, you know, there are various other ways as well, uh, uh, various other articles that are published pro and, and con, you know, in the last f five, ten years. So I, I wouldn't consider it dead by any means. Um, but, yeah, th that would be if, if you were skeptical, if you think it's dead, if you think it's a really bad argument, uh, I think you need to go to Chris first. That would be my first place to go. Mm. Well, awesome, Tyler. I thank you so much for your time and just this great um, talking about this argument. So it's really interesting just to think about. And obviously, if I'm thinking about it, you know, theism kind of makes its way through. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Is there any kind of like last thoughts you want to bring up before we wrap things up here? Yeah, no. Um, that, I guess one, one other thing. Um, you could also sort of just uh, instead of um, instead like you you could actually admit, like, okay, we have reliable faculties, right? But you can sort of still turn this into an argument for God's existence, right? You could say, well, on the hypothesis that theism is true, would you expect us having reliable faculties more 
than you would expect having reliable faculties on, on atheism. So even if the evidence to be explained, you know, uh, everyone agrees on is that we have reliable faculties. Nonetheless, it seems like you would expect this more on theism than on atheism. And so that's another version sort of of the argument that you could make. And uh, I think that's also a very powerful tool. So um, yeah, if, if anyone's more interested um, in seeing more of my work uh, or Eric's work, as I mentioned, um, see uh, tylermcnab.com or uh, we have a, a ministry where we interview different philosophers as well and uh, write blog posts and post some of our work called furtheringchristendom.com. Yeah, so, that's with Mike DeVito, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Tyler McNabb and an ex NFL player going and further. Right, for right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Love to see yeah, Mike, it. Uh, Mike's a former NFL player of nine years, and now he's uh, doing a PhD with the University of Birmingham. So, yeah, he's a very, very smart guy, very, uh, and a wonderful heart. So he's a great guy, a great philosopher. He is a great guy. And unfortunately, though, he's not a Steelers fan, so I hold that against him. <laughs> but, you know, he played. It, it's okay. We won, anyways. Um, I was talking with Mike about how. He played against the Steelers in the AFC Championship game, and I just remember that game because I'm a Steelers fan. And it's funny, like I talked with a guy who apparently like missed the assignment or something to help the Steelers get to the Super Bowl. I forget exactly what it was. So, <laughs> I'm sure he loved you mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> he told me about it, but yeah. Um, oh, Tyler, it's been so much fun, man. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, I really yeah. appreciate it. Absolutely. God bless. God bless. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Please be sure to like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Have a good one. God bless.